Welcome back to the AI and Legal series. I'm absolutely delighted today to welcome Patrick Fair from Patrick Fair Associates. Uh, you know the topic, it's all about generative AI, chat GPT and IP rights, just such a critically important topic at the moment. So a really good one to be part of this series. Again, absolutely delighted to have you here. I'm going to disappear off screen and hand over to you. Really looking forward to this presentation. Thank you again for doing it for us. My pleasure. Uh, thank you, Terry. And uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining uh, this seminar. Um, so today we're going to be discussing regenerative AI um, and IP rights. Um, I propose to uh, deal with these topics during the course of the discussion. I've put copyright in bold there because a lot of the talk is about copyright. I think copyright in particular for... Uh, language model generative AI, and, and I suppose visual models as well, um, is the key um, uh, subject matter, the key right that we'll be concerned about. Um, but as you know, intellectual property rights cover um, uh, are a sort of basket of different sets of legal frameworks to protect um, intangible um, commercial interests. And um, so I'm going to work through the list and just make some comments about design rights, circuit layout rights, trademarks, patents, and then we'll deal in, in substance with copyright. Um, those of you who are on your toes will um, be thinking, yes, but um, is that all the IP? Um, there's two obvious ones that's missing. One is plant variety rights, um, uh, uh, being a, a, or plant breeders' rights, and in those in that case, um, yes, you might plan how to <laughs> do your crosses and your breeding with recommendations from AI, but your ownership of the seed that results in the control that happens wouldn't be impacted by the fact you used AI to, um, to plan your breeding program. And in relation to confidential information, um, I just have one thing to say. You don't put your client details or other confidential information into one of these online platforms. Um, although uh, looking at the terms of use that apply to uh, say ChatGPT, um, the uh, reuse right is limited to optimizing the platform and protecting the interests of the provider. But nevertheless, it's a third party disclosure and there are gaps in the way that uh, restriction works. So um, to the extent that you're using uh, um, the, pla the platform for something which involves sharing confidential information, I recommend you don't. Um, uh, on the other hand, the fact that you've used the platform and may have generated something that's valuable and needs to be kept a secret, um, again, the, the usual rules apply about um, protecting the information from unauthorised use and disclosure, and there's nothing special about the fact that the information was generated using AI. Um, now, knowing that this is part of a series, I've sort of cut down my introduction as to generative AI basics, but knowing that some of you will be, um, perhaps haven't seen some of the other seminars or haven't yet got into it, I hope uh, the rest will be, bear with me while I just do a little bit of scene setting um, around uh, how this technology works at a high level and um, hope to draw out some features which are important in order to understand how the legal frameworks might interact with the new technology. Uh, after that, we're going to do design rights, circuit layout rights, trademarks, patents, and then spend a bit of time on copyright. And I'll look at some of the um, discussion papers that are current um, and or developments internationally too um, before we conclude. So um, what is uh, generative um, AI? And the clue um, is in fact that chat GPT is called GPT. Some people have asked, you know, what does GPT stand for? for? And it stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. So um, when you uh, go into what a generative pre-trained transformer is, a generative means that it um, aims to learn underlying patterns or structures of a data set and use that knowledge to create new examples that are similar in style or content to the original data. Um, so um, uh, generative means it's taking examples and generating similar examples. Pre-trained um, refers to the fact that it's um, taking in those examples at a very large um, 
on a very large scale and that the choice of um, input examples that you give it um, can uh, um, influence what it does and how it responds to certain tasks, um, but it can also be fine-tuned for a particular task. Um, so uh, the idea is to, to teach the model useful features arising from the way it represents the data in uh, its um, software model. And um, transformer refers, refers to um, the use of a kind of neural network architecture um, for um, natural language processing tasks. And uh, they're particularly good for processing sequential data um, and um, capturing dependencies between different data. So if you um, haven't yet read anything or, or seen a, um, an update on, you know, neural network architecture and software programming. It's been around um, a while, um, but um, the summary that I keep in mind is it's like um, having uh, a, um, a layer of uh, data points stacked very high. Um, in, in fact, I understand that um, for some of these tools, the, um, the number of data points um, in layers stacked up um, that are the, the neurons, if you like, of a neural network um, is uh, in the um, millions and, and some have said hundreds of millions. And essentially what happens when you put information into the system is the data points make a note of um, how um, certain features relate to one another. So this data point has a strong connection with that one and a weak connection with this one and a very strong connection with that one. And if you layer up enough of those, you can get um, uh, a sort of representation of the data that shows how features connect and associate with one another through a mimicking of the way neurons in the brain work. So it's called neural network architecture. I saw a uh, scientist from the Defence Science Technology um, Department in Canberra talk about what happens when you ask a neural network um, a question as creating a gradient. And what happens is you put in a prompt or a question, and what it does is it goes through all these layers of um, the neural network and the, it resolves the input so as to gradually move through and create a kind of gradient to a particular uh, formulated answer, which I thought was an interesting way of sort of conceptually understanding what's going on. So we're talking about ChatGPT. Um, I put a note down the bottom that there are others uh, in terms of scale um, uh, generative AI language tools. So um, BARD is the Google one, Lambda is the Meta one. Um, there are others that are out there using other technologies and for particular purposes. And then, of course, this technology is being applied also outside language models to, um, you know, visual and audio models as well. Um, so, um, you know, the key uh, concept I was just talking about, um, about neural network architecture is it's composed of interconnected nodes, which are organized into layers. And the connections between those layers adjust depending on um, a sort of mathematical optimization based on the information that you put into it. Um, this is repeated over many um, layers until you get a, a kind of brain um, which is capable of sort of um, representing the data in, in one form. Um, the, um, the other concept that we'll mention a bit in, in talking about IP rights is the black box effect. And um, so a feature of this technology is that when you ask it a particular question, it's almost impossible uh, to understand why it gives the answer that it gives <laughs> because it's been trained on many thousands of, and hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of documents. And it's got so many layers and it's taking so much associated data out of what you've fed it. Um, when it comes up with a particular response to a particular question, um, it's really not possible to say exactly how that happens. Um, but obviously, um, the computer scientists who are working on this stuff um, do have um, some idea how to moderate it. So they talk about ChatGPT having guardrails. And there's also some concern being expressed by scientists involved in the area that Lambda is out there as a kind of test model and it doesn't have guardrails and people could really train it on whatever they wanted and, and it would produce um, uh, information based on whatever it's been trained on. Um, the black box effect is important because it says something about 
uh, the independence of the tool and also um, the lack of control that a user has when it uses a tool. So key points, um, this is autocomplete on steroids. It's um, it, it's um, uh, nicely summarized by an uh, executive uh, from Google as programming by example instead of programming by instructions. If you set up this software engine, you give it lots of examples and it infers relationships and um, associations and um, um, some kind of, you know, conceptually might say meaning from what you give it. Um, and it writes its own uh, model of that information based on the framework that you've created. Um, the theory about how it arrives at an answer is understood, but the calculation is not. And um, it's important to know that these things have guardrails. Um, on the subject of guardrails, I do recommend watching this video, The AI Dilemma, which is online, where some of the developers of this technology in, um, uh, in San Francisco talk about the, the technology. And uh, in, in the course of the discussion, one of them says that when they first programmed ChatGPT, uh, they didn't realize that it had learned chemistry. And if you asked it a question as to how to use home, um, uh, a home available chemi chemicals to make a bomb, it would tell you. And um, that's because it has this kind of independent um, inference and association that it builds up as it builds the network. So um, let's now apply this to some of the frameworks that exist for um, the protection of intellectual property. Um, so starting at the most base level, the Design Rights Act, very popular little piece of uh, um, IP protection. It protects the shape, configuration, pattern or ornamentation of an article. Um, you you, you um, have to have a new distinctive design that's applied to a registrable article, something in tangible form, literally, you know, uh, so you can protect a chair, even though chairs are well known and people have been sitting on chairs for a long time. If you, if you come up with something which has a unique shape, configuration, pattern or ornamentation, you apply under the Design Rights Act and you get um, a 10-year uh, right to exploit your particular um, shape configuration ornamentation. Now, the person who has the right to apply for design rights is um, called in the act uh, the designer. And uh, the, the um, rights belong to the person who is the designer or uh, the person who employed the designer if the design was created during the course of employment. So, um, We'll get into the sort of fine points around this, um, you know, what it means to design something. It's very similar to what it might mean to be the author of something under copyright um, as a sort of general, you know, English sort of concept. Um, um, and, but there isn't as much law about that as there is on the copyright front. Um, so if the designer was a machine, it would not be registrable because there would not be a person. Um, and also the machine uh, wouldn't be designing in the course of employment. So um, a bit like when we get to the copyright question, um, it, it comes down to whether you can claim to be the designer or whether the machine is the designer. And this depends a bit on how you controlled the machine and what you asked it to do. And if you um, developed a sophisticated prompt or refined your sophisticated prompt and controlled the output to the point where you selected when it was finished and you decided what the output was, reasonably you would be the designer. On the other hand, if you ask the AI to um, surprise you, um, as you can do this in, um, in uh, Midjourney, one of the um, image generating AIs, and it produces something, quite, um, quite probably um, there's, no, um, there's not a registrable design there because there wasn't a designer, um, only a machine, and uh, the designer didn't create it in the course of their employment. Um, um, unless you can argue that the um, uh, the employee did have you know put some, enough prompts to actually have control of the the um, output, so we'll talk about some of these issues of that distinction between um, the effort required to be a to be the designer. If it, I will have an analogy with copyright when we get to copyright, um, but circuit layout rights is a little bit different. In, in circuit layout rights, um, you have this. Um, unique piece of legislation that protects an eligible layout for a, um, a circuit. And um, it's protected um, if the eligible person, i.e. the person who um, makes it, um, is an Australian citizen or a body corporate. 
And so it seems with this framework, you, we're using the term maker, not the term a designer, and we're um, contemplating that the maker could be a corporation who might be using AI to, to make the, um, the, the uh, circuit layout. So you would think that um, it's hard to imagine um, you know, a circuit layout uh, that doesn't require you to tell you what tell the machine what you want it to do. And if the machine then produces one for you, um, you would be the maker of that output. So here we've got a, a straight up distinction between a designer where you need human sort of input and a maker where all you're doing is being the cause of something that produces the output. Um, Trademarks are different in a, is worth mentioning, but diff, has a different kind of issue to, to talk about. You know, as, as you know, a trademark is a, a word, um, name, signature, numeral, device, brand, heading, label, ticket, um, or, uh, even a scent, which is dis, a distinctive identifier of goods or services. That's our description from IP Australia. Um, and uh, you can have it protected um, uh, by, uh, at common law, um, by use, or you can have it protected um, by registering it. Um, interestingly, if um, your, uh, um, your, uh, your product is artificial intelligence, then um, the, the uh, IP Australia list for registering a brand in relation to artificial intelligence already contemplates it in a few ways. Um, uh, if you ask uh, AI, it tells you it should be registered as a service in class 42 where consulting and research appear. But um, if you put it into the pick list at IP Australia, you get, um, you've get you discovered that household and laundry cleaning robots with AI are actually in class seven and data feeders uh, for use and link, um, use with or link to AI and humanoid robots for repairing beverages or use in scientific research are in class nine. Um, so, um, as so, so uh, how does IP, the trademark IP, um, relate to um, uh, artificial intelligence? The answer is yes, you can register a mark in relation to it. Yes, the system uh, contemplates that you can register a mark. What about if you ask the AI to generate a mark for you? Um, well, um, if you use it um, subsequently, it'll become distinctive by use of common law. And if you register it, uh, you'll have rights as you would with any other mark. As to whether you might own the copyright in the mark, well, we're going to talk about copyright soon. And um, uh, uh, I think, you know, to the extent that um, uh, there may be um, an artistic work generated by AI where no copyright subsists, um, there's no reason why that wouldn't still be your trademark. Um, other people could infringe it by... Um, from a copyright, well, could not infringe it from a copyright point of view if it was a sufficient work for copyright to subsist. But if you've made it distinctive of your products, either by use or by registering it, that won't matter because it's your trademark. Um, and uh, in a way, it's kind of curious it might create a, um, um, there's a right of control there, which would exist even if um, copyright doesn't uh, subsist. And when you think about it, that's the case in any in any way in uh, in already with you know, words which are not sufficiently um, substantive or don't have enough work for a copyright to subsist. You know, small phrases and uh, unique um, words. Um, what about patents? Well, this is um, uh, a little bit more interesting and and. Uh, uh, sophisticated, a few more issues to talk about. As you know, the Patents Act um, grants exclusive rights to exploit an invention. And in order to have an invention, um, it needs to be a matter of manufacture within the meaning of the old statute of monopolies. Um, but it has to be new. So when you compare it with the prior art, it has to be novel and involve an incentive step, inventive step and be useful. Um, and um, uh, there's also this uh, requirement that it kind of been um, secretly used um, in the patent era uh, before the priority date, claim priority date. And so um, under Section 15.1a of the Patents Act, the person who uh, makes or devises the inventor of the invention is the person who is uh, entitled um, to uh, um, uh, 
apply for the patent or somebody who derives it from that person who uh, makes or devises the invention. So there's clearly a kind of uh, creative step here. Um, it uses the word person again, which refers to a natural person or a corporate entity, um, but it doesn't sort of contemplate that the person who makes or devises might be an AI. So there could be an argument that an AI can't be registered as the inventor. And as luck would have it, there's a recent case, Mission of Patents and Taylor, um, where on appeal, um, an application for an AI to be named as the uh, patent as the inventor of a patent was refused. Interestingly, the judge at first instance said there's nothing in the act which prevents uh, you saying your inventor was AI. But um, uh, on appeal, full court said no. Uh, consistent with the similar decisions in other jurisdictions, um, AI cannot be the inventor of a, a patent. Um, but that's not where AI issues with patents stop because um, um, it's quite unclear what uh, might be the impact of using AI to make an invention. Um, you know, can there be an inventive step if the formula, if this solution is formulated by AI? And um, can you say that the solution was not obvious if it's formulated by AI? This touches on a broader question when we have um, these machines helping us with things and they have an immense capacity to come up with solutions and propose um, novel um, uh, um, uh, outcomes to difficult questions, does that change the context in which uh, normal human activity is taking place and move the bar so that um, something you might have thought was an inventive step is in, ask any AI, it will tell you that's what you should be doing. Um, and uh, something you thought was not obvious is obvious because an AI would nominate it straight away. Um, also, there's a question as to um, if the AI uses a um, method or process that is patented, um, uh, could it be infringing if you ask it to solve a problem and, and it develops its own methodology? But that's sort of being postulated. There's not much more to it um, than that postulation at the moment. Um, and uh, also, if the AI does infringe, then who would be liable? Um, uh, the uh, AI itself or its owner, particularly because you have this black box effect, right? Where if you set it to do something, you don't really know how it's going to achieve it. So attributing responsibility to um, the owner or the person who gives it the prompt might be a little problematic. Um, and this raises a question which will come up towards the end of the discussion today, which is, you know, when we're looking at these interesting questions about the traditional IP framework and what it protects, um, the government is facing a kind of, um, you know, there's a policy question. Do we maintain it so that it only incentivizes human creation because that's um, uh, what it's always done and, you know, we are human? Um, or do we allow um, the... Um, IP framework to reward things created by IP because taking knowledge and um, and uh, discovery forward benefits all people. Um, uh, an interesting question. So so now um, let's talk about copyright. Um, now, as you know, copyright is divided into two um, main categories. There's a, there's works and there's subject matter other than works. So we'll talk about works first. Um, uh, under Section 32 of the Copyright Act, copyright subsists in original works if the author is a qualified person. And uh, a qualified person means an Australian citizen or um, a person resident in Australia. Um, interestingly, um, uh, um, that hints to the fact that it has to be a natural person. Um, a work can be a literary, a dramatic, a musical, or artistic work. And uh, the term original is not defined by the act, it's taken as given. Um, and uh, the word author is defined only in relation to photographs. So author is also um, um, taken as given, um, but the author is deemed by section 35 to be the owner of uh, the work. So uh, let's have a look at what a, a, an artistic work is. Um, an artistic work is a painting, sculpture, drawing, engraving, or photograph whether of artistic quality or not. 
And um, uh, what's interesting about that, of course, is that um, when an image is generated by a computer, is it a painting, uh, a sculpture, a drawing, an engraving? It's not a photograph. It's not an engraving. It might be a drawing, um, but remember, it's not been drawn. <laughs> so uh, um, I think the accepted wisdom there is that it probably would be treated as a drawing. And drawing is done on iPads where, um, you know, the movement of the hand creates an image using a machine. But um, there, is, there is a kind of threshold question there. Should somebody be taking on um, the copyright in an image produced by um, uh, a generative AI because it's um, actually not an artistic work within those categories? Um, and with a uh, literary work, um, it can be a, a table compilation expressed in words or figures or symbols. So it takes a different kind of approach. It doesn't reference the old ways of creating something. It just says it's about words, figures or symbols and includes a computer program. Um, uh, also, um, so I mentioned that the word author, author is not defined in the act, but um, the, the, some really useful law on um, uh, having um, what it means to be an author. Um, is um, uh, this um, a little paragraph from uh, the full court decision in ICE TV and the Nine Network? And um, forgive me if I um, I just read it because we're going to use this a little bit. So originality for this purpose requires a literary work in question to have originated with the author. I think we all knew that, um, and not be copied. We knew that. Um, uh, it's got to be the author that brings it into existence. And in this context, originality means that the creation of the work requires some, this is the key thing, independent intellectual effort, um, but doesn't have to have literary merit or novelty. Um, and, uh, and the court then observes that authorship and original are kind of co-relatives, i.e. They, they're not double, they're the same thing. If, you're the, if, you're, if you create something which is original, then you're the author, you kind of have the implied in, intellectual effort of creating something original. Um, um, but there are some special cases um, in relation to that, like in relation to a photograph. Um, it means the person who took the photograph, um, you know, that's actually quite tricky because photographs are sometimes taken by machines. Uh, they're motion activated or they're, um, uh, they're, the, the, something has been set up to take the photograph. There's some law that suggests that if you set something up so it takes a photograph on some particular symbol, then you're the author, even though the machine actually chose which one to take. Um, uh, there's also some exceptions for um, work, works made under the uh, terms of employment. Um, and uh, um, the, the exception, which applies to some um, you know, contractual um, photographs. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about um, you know, these, how things work. Um, so, um, uh, interestingly, um, uh, the, um, the Copyright Act itself doesn't talk about a person, and when you go to the Acts Interpretation Act, it could include a body politic, but it's never going to include chat GPT, um, and, uh, um, uh, because it's not a body politic or a person. Now, um, so here is um, an interesting case which goes to this question of... Um, what it means to create a copyright work. Before you drop, you jump into that, we've actually got a question on point here that I'm, I might just drop in here if I may. It's, um, is a painting done by a robot creating a visual image generated by a GPT considered original artistic work or even a sculpture done by a robot? Um, well, the answer comes down to um, whether or not the person who uh, sets the robot um, uh, in in, in um, motion uh, has used uh, has um, used that uh, um, made sufficient intellectual effort to to be the author. So um, as I mentioned earlier, you can go to Mid Journey and you can say surprise me. And uh, I think the best view is that if you do that, the image which is created has no copyright because you made no intellectual effort and you didn't determine the outcome. On the other hand, if you go to uh, Mid Journey and you say, "Please do me a picture of a robot inventing," as I I did with um, with the uh, Dali E Microsoft program to create an image in the first slide, um, then there's an argument that my minimal intellectual effort 
in relation to this tool was sufficient to make me the author of the work. Um, I was just using a tool to, to generate it. Um, so, um, uh, but the distinction is, is the one that's in, on the screen in front of us uh, here, which is, um, you know, uh, and, and th this was the point we really, I was just making, which is that if you look at the Telstra directories case, um, the court thought that the computer system was responsible for the production of the book and the extract. Um, and um, that uh, it wasn't, you know, anything of the work of an individual and therefore um, uh, the uh, no copyright subsisted in the, in the directories as a result. And that's the sort of outcome where you get with a surprise me, a direction to, um, uh, to a, a generative AI. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, so that's, that's works. The, the key test is, has there been a sufficient intellectual effort by a human person who might be the author of the work, uh, except in the case of uh, uh, photographs where it's the taker of the photograph who um, is made the author. What about subject matter other than works? And um, this is quite interesting. Um, you might know that sort of the Copyright Act um, gives rights to um, uh, sound recordings and cinematograph films and television and uh, sound broadcasts and also in published works. And here you don't have the concept of author. You have instead the concept of uh, the maker or the publisher. So in the case of a sound recording, it's the maker of the sound recording um, or the person who engaged the sound, the maker for valuable consideration who um, owns the, the, um, the, uh, the copyright in it, although there might be an interest in the, in the performers in a live recording. And likewise with um, cinematograph films, with movies essentially, um, it's the maker um, or somebody who, who, who uh, was um, engaged them under commission to um, who owns the copyright in the work. And likewise with broadcasts, it's the broadcaster. Um, so the point I wanted to make here is that um, if you generate um, uh, a movie, or if you generate a, a song using generative AI, which you can do, there may be no copyright in the music um, unless you can show uh, creative input sufficient to make a musical work. But uh, the sound recording you've made of what the machine happened to do at the time is your sound recording because you helped make it. And, uh, and therefore, um, the recording itself can have copyright even if the um, musical work itself has none. And it's a similar thing with films. Um, you can use a generative AI to make a motion um, uh, a video, uh, you know, with um, items and symbol, you know, with um, people moving in a scene. And if you did that for a whole video um, using elements that are all invented by the AI, um, it's at least theoretically possible that um, you might not have any copyright in what was there. It's much more likely that humans would be controlling and designing and would have a right to say, well, you know, I, I, there was an original intellectual effort. But if you did it without that intellectual effort, the film might have no copyright, but the, um, the, 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 the maker, the producer of the film um, would own um, the, the copyright in it as the producer, um, no, even, oh, sorry, even though the script didn't have any copyright and the, and the um, you know, the sounds and so on didn't have copyright. Um, and likewise, the television broadcasts, you could produce content using um, uh, generative AI um, news readers um, where um, all they're doing is producing a script and the machine is doing it. So, um, if the script was written by AI, as you know, can can happen. Um, I understand that already people are publishing sports stories where what the AI just takes the the history of the team and the results of the game and some information about who scored the goals and turns it into a sports article. If you put if you gave something like that to a um, a broadcaster and used AI to generate it. You wouldn't be able to find copyright in the, the text of what they said, and there wouldn't be a performer there to do it, um, so to, to have performance rights, but there would be um, uh, uh, still copyright in the broadcast. Um, so, uh, so this is quite interesting that um, generative AI uh, can be content of a sound recording, a film or broadcast, and be protected by copyright for that reason. Um, 
without resolving the question of whether there's copyright in the underlying work. Um, uh, but uh, it's but it's also highly problematic as to whether you know there would be any performance rights associated with that because the performance rights do seem to suggest that you need a natural person. Um, another thing to look at here, and this sort of I just touch on this because some people have said, well, um, you know, doesn't the machine itself own some copyright? Or what about the inventors or architects of the machine? Isn't there some joint copyright here? And what about the uh, content that the generative AI is being trained on. So it's taken this stuff in, and it's built its neural network, or it's, you know, it learned by, from those examples, and now it's outputting similar stuff. Um, shouldn't there be um, uh, some sort of shared copyright? So there's three types of um, uh, shared copyright in the Copyright Act. One's uh, works of joint authorship, and they need to be produced by the collaboration of two or more authors, um, uh, where, um, the contribution of each author is not separate from the contribution of the other. So it's kind of tricky to see how you might say that something produced by generative AI was sort of a collaboration between the two, you know, similar things or thousands of similar things it was trained on. It's certainly not um, uh, like they weren't separate contributions and they've been trained on. It just seems not to fit. So. Uh, certainly joint authorship doesn't seem to be applicable. Um, what about making an adaptation? Um, uh, well, this is where you, um, you know, take a version of the work um, um, and you know, um, in non-dramatic form and turn it into a dramatic form or um, in a dramatic form and turn it into a non-dramatic form or you take a computer program being a version in one um, uh, form and turn it into... Um, a different sort of form of program, or you translate something, um, or you uh, convert something which is um, uh, conveyed um, in a, a literary work into something conveyed by pictures. So you can see there's some sort of quite precise examples here of taking something and making an adaptation where you've preserved the original idea, but you've expressed it in a different way. Now, this is um, quite an interesting possibility that you might take a... Um, uh, a novel and give it to ChatGPT and say, please write me a script. If that's the case, I would argue that the script is an adaptation of the novel because you've um, clearly um, made a, um, a version, um, taken a non-dramatic version and made it a dramatic version. Likewise, if you converted a computer program from one language to another, you would argue that was an adaptation. So you might see this as a, a, a possible um, opening that feeding stuff into chat GPT or one of the AI engines uh, can easily result in the production of an adaptation for copyright purposes. What about derivative works? Well, um, derivative works are actually pretty narrow <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the Copyright um, uh, Act. Um, it, um, uh, the, there's a, there's a, the use of the word derived in relation to a sound recording. So it's possible that um, a sound recording uh, where you've um, derived a new recording out of an old one could be a derivative work. And it's also possible that um, uh, you, if you derive information from a computer program to use it and make a new computer program, um, uh, you've derived a new one. And so that, that could be relevant in one of the cases I'm going to mention shortly. Um, so let's, uh, let's have a look at some cases and some terms and conditions. Um, uh, I recommend, firstly, if you're really interested in the subject, reading this terrific paper um, from uh, these two authors in the Columbian Law School. Um, they shortcut my research a little bit on which examples I might mention, and so I want to give them credit. And also, if you're up for 110 pages, really exploring the nuances of copyright and uh, generative AI, um, that's where you should start. Um, so I want one case that's interesting is this really old case um, 1983 about um, Galaxian and Pac-Man video games where the defendant made some enhancement devices that copied the audio visual output of the games and argued that copyright didn't subsist because the output depended on the way the user played the game. You know, you'd expect that, you know, if the things move on the screen and that all depends on how you play. Um, the court said, no, the output's determined by the game's circuit board and there are only a number of control sequences that can be outputted. So the author of the machine 
owned the copyright in the images that were displayed by the machine. Now, that'd be interesting, but with generative AI, we don't really have a case like that because we're training our machine with examples and uh, we're not limiting in any way what kind of outputs um, it might um, produce. Um, another sort of similar uh, case is this one about um, uh, a, um, a software program that foretold uh, phrases that appeared in the Hebrew Bible at equidistant uh, letter skips. And um, the uh, software company said it owned the output of its software program. And uh, the court said, yes, you do, because there's only one set of output that can be given. There's, it's fixed and repeatable, and it's determined by the program. So um, another example where um, the output generated by a digital system is um, found to be controlled by the owner of the software, but only because the output was fixed and repeatable, which doesn't seem to be the case with generative AI. And a little bit closer to, to home, this more recent case about the motor contour program, which was used to shape and capture 3Ds um, and the motion of a human, in, in 3D, the shape and motion of a human face and used in movies, um, specifically Beauty and the Beast and Deadpool and Terminator. Um, the, apparently the use of the program was unauthorized. So the, the uh, owner sued and said, I have an interest in these films. And um, the, uh, the court said that um, the software was highly sophisticated and certainly did a lion's share of the work creating the uh, images which were formed part of the film. But, um, but it depended on such a large range of inputs uh, that it wasn't really software which was creating the film, it was the facial expressions, the actor movement and other things inputting. And so that sort of supports this argument that if you, you know, are controlling the prompt and giving the generative AI lots of guidance, then the output is probably yours and, um, and not, um, the result, uh, not resulting from the machine. And, um, and uh, you know, it's interesting uh, here that, um, you know, similar to generative AI, it's, it's hard to think that the MOVA contour program would actually own the copyright in something because um, it's a tool um, which is used in a context like a generative AI rather than actually having some standard content that it always produces every time it's run. Um, now, as it happens, um, uh, the uh, Telstra Corporation phone directory case has uh, a beautiful paragraph just on this point. Um, and um, I'm proud to say that um, this paragraph was found by the Generative AI published by Jade IO, the Jade research platform, uh, Jasmine. I asked it to, if, you know, supporting my research, if it could find something on this question. And this is what it found beautiful. I hadn't seen it when I first saw the case. So, really good. Um, so, um, this makes this actually discusses the question of, you know, when you control an operating program, um, uh, will you um, own the output? And um, the court says, so long as the person controlling the program can be seen as directing or fashioning the material, um, there's no particular danger in viewing the, it as the work of the author. But if the person operating the program is not controlling the nature of material produced by it, then um, there won't be sufficient in, in, um, intellectual effort or effort of a literary nature for the creation to be that of the author. Um, you know, the person, uh, an autopilot engaged is flying itself. And so there's an interesting distinction. And that's telling you that if you don't actually put sufficient guidance into generative AI, then the material that it produces will not be your copyright. But I'd also say, and this is quite an important um, observation, that often if you're trying to prove copyright in a case, you, um, you uh, um, need to show the author and this is saying that if I wanted to prove copyright in something which I'd use, I'd produced using AI, I might need to keep the prompts and <laughs> as a record to so, so that if I'm challenged, I can show the court that it was my original work because I had done sufficient um, prompting, um, uh, guiding the output. Um, so I've made this little table which sort of tries to summarize the consequences of this. Um, as you know, we've been using software to make um, uh, creative output for a long time, um, you know, Word, Draw, Photoshop, uh, Minecraft creates an environment, Google Maps creates an environment when you ask it, 
And, and so on the left, I've sort of uh, put down the row of the role of the machine, and then I've put the role of the human, and I've put what might be a conventional um, uh, result, and then I've put some comment sort of indicating the degree to which. And as you can see, it's sort of non-controversial that if you use a program like Word or Draw or Photoshop to modify an image and control it, then you're the author. But down the bottom, if you use generative AI to automatically produce something with no little or no instruction, then it's quite possible there'll be no copyright. Um, so some, uh, some points in conclusion. Um, first thing to note is that this uh, topic is hot. It's generating litigation um, in the US. Um, this uh, very recent case where artists have sued the um, uh, image generating um, software um, a generative AI products called the Stability Mid Journey uh, Deviant Art, alleging infringement because it was trained on images scraped from the web, and they say that the output, um, you know, is uh, infringing their copyright when it produces things which um, have been uh, the result of the images it's been trained on. And uh, similarly, um, uh, Getty Images is uh, st suing Stability AI for using its images without permission. Um, and uh, so I just comment in those cases, this goes to this really interesting question, right? If you go back to the start of the um, seminar, um, you've got a, um, an, uh, a neural network which has not actually taken a copy of anything and is not able to reproduce anything it's been trained on, but has taken features and characteristics and built a network of relationships which it can use to make similar output is that a copying engine or is it a thinking engine is it original when it produces something or is it just copying something and if you think it's just copying something then how come it's got so many engines and so, so much input and so many nuances isn't it sort of programmed to the point where it's hard to say that any particular image is whatever it you know, might reproduce so very interesting challenge there and um uh a uh, similar but related issue in this uh, case of um, Doe One versus GitHub, where um, some of the software that's being written by um, uh, the uh, ChatGPT driven coding assistant seems to reduce verbatim existing codes. Um, and the people who say, well, it was trained on my code, and when you ask it to write code to do that, it produces my code, therefore it must be copying, and therefore it's infringing, and therefore I'm going to sue it. Um, to the uh, operator, seems logical, but same thing. Um, code is very logical. The solution to a particular problem from a coding point of view might only be one solution. And um, uh, the copyright law is that if two people create an original work, which is the same, they both have copyright and one isn't infringing the other. The question is only, was there copying and was the work original? So um, is that going to be how the court... Uh, decides this case or is it going to say um, uh, no that the training is somehow even if it's in this big neural network uh, copying and therefore a reproduction is an infringing copy um, as you uh, it's important to note when you think that for these cases that the US has a fair use copyright law which allows the exploitation of, of copyright in a way which is not damaging to the commercial interests of the owner um, uh, and, but adds value in a commercial, um, uh, adds value in doing something new and creative. And, um, and we don't have that. We have uh, fair dealing, which is much more restrictive as to what might be permitted. So the outcome in these cases in the US wouldn't necessarily reflect, uh, reflect the, the law in Australia in terms of uh, um, the license that um, the generative AI had to make, uh, to use the copies for training. Um, just uh, some other points to note that are interesting. Um, one is that the UK um, Copyright Designs and Patents Act says that computer-generated works um, uh, are works which are generated by a computer in circumstances where there's no human author. And in this case, it's the person that makes the arrangements for the creation of the work who owns the copyright. And uh, there are similar provisions in the Hong Kong, Irish, Irish, New Zealand, and South African and Indian Copyright Acts. So we're a little bit of an outlier here, not having a specific provision in our act, which says that 
computer generated works are owned by the person who makes the arrangements necessary for the creation of the work. Instead, we have the test, which I was talking about, which is did the author, did the person dealing with the machine make sufficient intellectual effort as to make them the author? Um, also, I recommend having a look at this um, government paper on um, uh, exploring um, copyright law and uh, the um, uh, the uh, impact of uh, AI on IP. Given the time, I won't go into that in great detail, but they talk about that economic question of whether or not it's better to reward humans or to reward the capital that invests in these machines um, going forward. Um, and uh, interestingly, there's a decision in the US um, by the Copyright Office on the March 16th, which talks about copyright in materials generated by AI and is going into a public listening phase um, about it. Um, interestingly, you know, they say that uh, machines um, automatically generated by a computer algorithm are, um, are not copyright and have been rejected for registration under their system. Um, and they talk about the distinction um, between the human contribution and the machine generated work. So um, uh, that's quite interesting because it reflects the sort of tenor of what we were discussing um, in the US context, and it's only a little read, I recommend it. Um, so in conclusion, um, machine-generated uh, works can be protected by copyright, but the copyright depends on the extent to which the um, outputs are predetermined by the machine itself and the extent of your control, and um, possibly whether the work comprises an adaptation or is derived from the original work. Uh, copyrights will subsist in subject matter other than works, whether, whether, if, whether or not the content is generated by AI, and uh, you should know your prompts if you're planning to defend something, because if you've used AI to create it, it's arguable that you don't own copyright unless you can show your intellectual contribution to the creation of the work. Um, and we, we may be good to amend our act to include something like we have in the other cases. Um, and, and so there you are. Um, there's a, a one hour Crooks tour on um, copyright and, uh, and uh, generative AI. Um, uh, there's this discussion paper out, if you haven't seen it, which is asking uh, for broad input on um, how to manage and deal with AI. Um, one of the issues will be, you know, should we let AI put um, script writers and content producers out of work or at least supplement and replace them? And um, should there be policies that manage the ability of people investing in AI to own intellectual property, notwithstanding some of the barriers I was talking about. So um, I invite you to um, make a submission to that paper if you're interested. Uh, that concludes my talk. Um, Terry, uh, over to you for any questions. Thanks, Patrick. I, I've got one for you because I, I, as I was looking at the cases and listening to the presentation, and thank you very much for that, it seems that a lot of the activity, at least from um, an infringement point of view, is being directed towards those companies that are creating the AI. You know, they're basically the defendants in these companies. But of course, there'll be folks that then use the outputs of the AI, which may also be tainted for want of a better expression. Are we kind of on the precipice? It's probably early days yet, but are we on the precipice of kind of seeing the folks that are almost like the second iteration of the of the outputs also being hit with infringement. You know, so I'm thinking I've I've used Chat GPT. Um, I've uh, got all the bits and pieces that I want from it, and then I actually publish that. Um, and even if I disclose that it came from Chat GPT, I've still done something with it. If I have, I potentially then infringed as well. And and I and it may be a question that we can't answer yet because there's just not enough of it. But I'm just wondering whether it will extend that far. Do you see that in the future as being something as well? Well, a key part of the picture there is to read the terms and conditions of ChatGPT. And um, uh, I tried to find some for BARD, I should say, but they just said that Google says it's a test platform. <laughs> but ChatGPT have extensive terms and conditions and they say that the output of the machine belongs to you mm. um, if there is anything to own. So they don't. They absolutely disclaim any liability or representation that it's um, proprietary, accurate. You know, um, uh, any any non infringing, all disclaimed. But mm. to the extent that there is some original copyright in what's produced, they're happy to say that the user owns it. The other thing that's relevant is that they have a um, 
acceptable use policy, which says that you should attribute when uh, using output from the machine. Um, and uh, it's a little bit problematic because I've never um, uh, ever used all of what they've given me. And if I and when I have used parts of what they've given me, it's only been a kind of few words here and there. So I'm not going to give them credit for yeah. <laughs> getting me started. Um, and so, so that 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 line is also a bit problematic. But yeah. the the possibility that something it gives you is a close reproduction from something else and that somebody can make a kind of GitHub argument saying that, well, we don't care where you got it. Um, well, the, 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 they will say that um, it was trained in and therefore you, you got an unauthorised reproduction from the product and therefore you were not authorised to reproduce it and your use was unauthorised as well. That's possible. Um, I just don't know that it's statistically very likely considering the amounts of information that it, it has and the fact that when it's trained on this content, it, 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 it absorbs it into its network and doesn't actually keep a single copy of the single thing that it saw so that it could go back and reproduce that. Mm. That's the issue, isn't it? It's, it is that black box issue. Um, we've got a couple of questions, Patrick, and literally a minute to go. So I'm going to try and going to try and squeeze them in. Um, so the first one is: if I've used ChatGPT to generate a science fiction novel about astronauts riding horses on the moon in the style of Stephen King, what are my chances of claiming copyright on the output? Um, it depends on the extent of your input, right? If you if you've read it and you've edited it and you've given it more questions and you've guided the content. Uh, this is a very good argument that uh, you did sufficient intellectual effort to be the author. Um, and, um, uh, you know, that, that's the outcome of, of the thing I was discussing. You know, there was no, it's a very low bar. And um, the question is, is, did you expend intellectual effort on the creation? If you stood back and just let the machine do it, answer no. But if you've read it, edited it, controlled it, asked it questions, guided the plot, probably you're the kind of you're the, the, the author so you heard it first here folks we look forward to reading that one and here's the very last question where do you think the line would be between sufficient and insufficient prompting or guidance for an ai to cross the intellectual effort threshold um uh i'm uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna say look i'm happy to go with the line is don't ask it to surprise you. <laughs> if you ask it to surprise you, you're on the wrong side of the line. Um, however, I think uh, I think the line which where you are the owner is is only two or three prompts from that. It might be less than that because the courts really do say, you know, you you um, you uh, need to have input. This is an issue which is going to have to be explored because if you think about that decision in the Telstra Directories case where they talk about the autopilot, right? An autopilot adjusts the plane's altitude and direction and other things, you know, over the course of something. Now, if you ask it to write a novel with only three or four plots, three or four prompts, then probably that's analogous to an autopilot. You haven't done much more than set it flying. And, and so perhaps the answer to your, your question is um, that it might depend on the output. Some mm. output will require you to have a lot of prompts to control it in order to say you're the author, something like a novel, whereas other output that's relatively short and punchy might only take three or four prompts or, or, two, or even you know, two or three to, to, for you to exercise sufficient control to say that um, you know, you've determined what that is. Yeah, absolutely. Patrick, thank you so much. We covered an awful lot in an hour. So I know if folks would like to reach out to you, obviously they'll um, find you at the very least on LinkedIn, but a whole bunch of other places as well. And that I know also that you're open to that. So folks, if you do have other questions on this, you know, some of these questions are not easy to determine as we've seen in the questions. Um, so do reach out to Patrick. I know that he'd be more than willing to help you. So again, Patrick, thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone who attended as well. Great discussion, great questions. Really appreciated those as well. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.